Hold on to your hats because you're about to go on a heck of a ride. There's a horn in the charge is underway. Stills go in. Outriders mount up and there goes the Duke of New I'm Lisa Gunther, Canadian Cattleman Editor and your host this week for Between the Rows. We're going to meet three women who are redefining what pink collar work looks like. We'll visit chuck wagon driver Amber LaRue as she gets ready for the season. I grew up in wagon racing, so it's what I do, but I love the training of it. I love watching these horses go from day one, being chubby and out of shape, come out of winter, shed out, shine up, leg up, and just seeing the confidence build in them as they get stronger. And we'll talk to two livestock photographers about capturing a cow's good side and staying off her bad side. But first, here's a word from our sponsors. No matter how big or small your operation is, every producer could always use a little help. That's why RBC is giving you the chance to win an S540 Bobcat Skid Steer Loader. Make your day just a little more efficient with this versatile piece of equipment. Clear snow, spread manure, or muck out stalls all with the same machine and be able to do more faster. Visit scoraskidsteer.com backslash rules for full contest details. Contest closes June 15, 2022. While attending the cattle auction at the Livestock Market Association of Canada conference a few weeks back, I noticed a woman dressed in a shimmering pink duster. She was photographing the cattle in the ring. There's an egg professional I haven't interviewed yet, I thought to myself. Jill Renton and Daisy Prashekup are livestock photographers with DLMS Cattle Bids. They filled me in on what it takes to shoot cattle and how to avoid getting rolled by irate bovines. Uh, my name is Jill Renton. Uh, I'm Daisy Prashekup. <laughs> and are you from Lloydminster area or? Um, I live south of Calgary. Um, in the foothills today. and i live just by wasetna north of edmonton okay great yeah so we're at the livestock uh lmac conference and i've noticed you two capturing photos around the uh, auction mart today um how uh jill we'll start with you how did you get into photography um i started photography about 15 years ago now i guess um, and I started to go along with graphic work that I did and then the photography kind of took off and, um, growing up with cattle, uh, they were an easy subject to start with all the time. So, um, I started probably about 10 years ago. Um, we started by selling purebred cattle and stuff like that. So I had watched one lady had come and pictured ours one year. And then after that, we just kind of ran with it ourselves. <laughs> so that's kind of where it started. <laughs> so, and one thing I think, uh, like a skill set you maybe need that um you don't necessarily need in other photography jobs is being able to read cattle is that something Mm -hmm. understanding cattle anatomy is the key (laughs) i think (laughs) but and reading cattle helps but yeah Um, understanding their build and type helps a lot in a picture pen and is that just so they're set up properly to showcase them best or um... yeah to find their best angle Okay. <laughs> is what so, I would say. So they have a good side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <100%. laughs> Find my good side. <laughs> yeah, and they also have bad days in the bedroom. Bed. <laughs> but and and how did you learn that? Like, were you was it four H or just being around livestock? Or um, I started in four H, and that's I mean, cattle judging like judging confirmation from an early age. I guess you kind of have an idea of what you want as your ideal, and then. You're always just positioning so that animal looks the best that it can look. Yeah. Um, so it would have started with 4-H um, and then just personal taste in cattle too. I think. Yeah. yeah, I would say mine probably started more with my family was a little more. And then we got into the 4-H thing and that just kind of helped you at least explain what you were looking for. Instead of just being like, I like this one, but I'm not sure why. <laughs> so it helps you with the terminology. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
And uh, so it's one thing to kind of photograph show animals or whatever when people can set them up. But this is a, in the auction where it's a totally different environment. Like yeah. what, what's your strategy for trying to get their their good side yeah on a day like today it's it's just what looks best you just kind of go with it because there's you're never going to find the perfect shot today and if you get it great that's just an added bonus yeah so it's nice to showcase um in the commercial cattle you want to show as much consistency in the groups as you can so the larger groups are easier to capture that um and it really promotes the mart and um the the commercial breeders as well yeah yeah Really makes the consigner look like a star. Yeah, yeah. So that's the basic. You're always working for the customer, so you're yeah. trying to make them as much money as you can and make their things look as great as you can. <laughs> yeah. So, um, one thing I kind of always think a little bit about with because these cattle are coming into the ring and they're a little, especially if they're alone, they're sort of like worked yeah. up. Do you um, do you sort of think about that, like when you're positioning yourself, so you're not. I don't know, spooking them or something. Is that a concern? Um, my angle, uh, down closer to the ring, I'm noticing that I am... The spook object. I'm spooking them. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm very aware that I am the object that's crouching and I they don't want to come in. So I've tried to get behind that shield a little bit more each time. But <laughs> yeah. not as easy as you can with a packed house. So Yeah, I know. I'm but. finding the same thing. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Once we find our purchase, we just stand and yeah. wait. So yeah. basically, yeah. But and we're also showcasing. You want to showcase the auctioneer themselves as much. As, yeah. Today, as our today subject is more is more them yeah. than the cattle. So. Yeah. Yeah. Which is much worse than cattle. <laughs> it's much worse than cattle. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get them in their yeah. mouths and open. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. Like eyes are not closed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so lots of pictures today. Yeah. 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 So is that your strategy in the, in this kind of environment where it's like everything's moving? Fast it's paced. just like trying yeah. to get as many photos as possible. Is that kind of the, yeah, well, you're, you're still aiming for quality. Yeah. Um, so you're selective of what you're shooting. You want to shoot a little more action, you know, when they're going to start um, getting more animated with their hands and catching bids and things like that. And yeah. So yeah, but it is still a lot more than when you're just picturing one animal yeah. by themselves. So, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so tell me, what what is it about this job that you love? Like, why do you do it? I'm in it for the people. I love it. <laughs> I, I love the social side. I love talking with other producers. Like, the social side of it for me is great. Like, uh, the cat working with the cattle is the added bonus. If you get to see good cattle along the way, that's a plus. But I am just in it. I like the beef industry. And it's just, uh, I don't know, that's my side i guess um i w- used to be a wedding photographer full-time um before i moved to alberta i'm originally from the maritimes and uh i came for the cows first i'm not gonna lie so yeah. this job is about the cows uh for me but the social aspect this industry is it's a big family yeah, like it's, second to none. yeah it's it's not it's like nothing nobody else you can't compare it to anybody else even like all the auctioneers they're great yeah like it's just yeah it's been a it's lots of fun yeah great group always and they're all happy to be back together. Yes. <laughs> so it's even better. <laughs> yeah. But so. And your job's also quite physical. Like that's, you know, because you're yeah. crouching and yeah. you're running up and yes. down those bleachers yeah. Yeah. steps. Um, I don't know. Is there like a fitness <laughs> training for photographers or something? Like no. how, do you, how do you avoid, I don't know, repetitive strain injuries or is that a consideration? Or? This is a lot easier than what we normally yeah. do. Um, okay. Like when we're normally in a picture pen and you have to climb up panels to uh, get out of bull's uh, ways and stuff. Yeah. That's This or is... escorted over. Uh, <laughs> so, this is a lot a lot easier on the yeah. body <laughs> just for yeah, this isn't so bad <laughs> but, uh, yeah when you're trying to protect a camera and crawl over a stand-up panel is a little bit more um more labor intensive we'll call it <laughs> but, have you had like close calls uh photographing we, we've both had, been mangled yeah <laughs> well, there's no close call we've just we've just eaten yeah. dirt yeah, yeah. yeah a whole bunch of times yes yeah. <laughs> Well, not quick enough. <laughs> Just as quick as you think you are, not. <laughs> so. Goes back to that reading cattle thing. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. you, I got one more shot. No, you don't. No, no you yeah. don't. She's done. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I guess I mean, just I find like because I. I I was copying what you were doing because <laughs> you're a better photographer than me. And so they're looking at you and they come closer and closer, but we've got a fence yep. between us today, but yep. other days, um, I guess you may not if you're right in the pen with them. Right yeah. Now. You, so yeah. yeah, you have to be pretty on your game um, yeah. for that. So. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's pretty well second nature to us though yeah. at this point it's i think we pay more attention to it than we think we do because we're just constantly mm-hmm. reading the cattle as they as before they even come in the pen yeah so like even here you're looking at them coming in the in gate and seeing okay can i sit here or yeah. can, should i back up on these ones but mm-hmm. yeah anyway. what's the the sign from a ornery cow that you need to move now <laughs> that you look honestly for. like their posture as soon as they come in you just or like i look at eyes as my like yeah, giveaway and telltale and you're like just get out of the pen everyone's out we're just letting her have her minutes yeah. um but yeah eyes and ears 100 yeah. percent. yeah 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 you can just see that body language when they come in yeah. and you're like nope everyone's a little tense <laughs> 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 That was Daisy Pershekup and Jill Renton of Cattlevids DLMS. You're listening to Between the Rows, and I'm your host this week, Lisa Gunther. There's the horn and a pretty good start off the barrel. COVID put a lot of things on hold two years ago, including chuck wagon racing. After the 2020 season was cancelled, Amber LaRue was champing at the bit to get back on the track. But an injury last spring left her on the benches for the 2021 season too. There's two things that I want you to know about Amber. One, she has to exercise three chuck wagon teams, that's 16 horses. And two, she's the only woman holding the reins in professional chuck wagon racing. I caught up with her earlier this month as she was truck training her horses to find out what motivates her to harness a team of high octane race horses and how she's carrying on despite a recent loss. Okay, introduce your horse. (laughs) This is Maddie. They're big mad. He is one of my leaders. He drives on left lead. And he's a gentleman, minus right now. <laughs> the big sweeteners. Are you ready to truck train, buddy? Here, Brock, I'll let you take these two out, please. Uh, Maddie on the left, trainer on the right front. So how do you get them used to um, like truck training? Uh, like so that when they're hot, cause they're hard tied, I guess, right? Like how do you, do they go along with it pretty good or? They usually go along with it really well, but for the most part, it's just taking everything really Okay. Once they figure out that this is how they get to train and it's low impact and all they have to do is jog alongside a truck to get their endurance in, yeah. they're usually super pumped about it. <laughs> I guess it's not that much different from like leaving them off a quad or something, hey? I think this is a lot safer. (laughs) Yeah, probably. Oh, so one thing I was gonna ask you about, I think you're the only female chuck wagon driver in the CPCA. Yes. And has there been anyone before you? No. And there's never been a female drive in the WPCA either. So that's pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> I. It's weird for me because my whole life this is all I've ever wanted to do, and I didn't really think about it until we kind of sat down with the marketing crew in twenty like twenty eighteen fall and started talking about what our edge was going to be going forward marketing wise to be competitive for sponsors, and then it hit me. It was like oh. Yeah, I guess no one has, you know, like I, I've just always competed with the boys and never really thought too much of it, but it is a huge crowd draw that I am the only female out there competing. Yeah. So how did you, like, tell me a little bit, I kind of know a little bit of your history, but like, how did you get into it? Um, so I am third generation on my mom's side and second generation for my dad. My grandfather 
raced thoroughbred chariots in what at the time would have been the Northern Chuck Wagon Association. And my mom also drive, drove thoroughbred chariots growing up. And her and my dad got together. And my dad had drove for 50 consecutive years. And my mom drove chariots for I don't know how many years. So growing up, I would have been three months old when we started going down the road racing ponies. And that's all I virtually know in my entire life. The last two years not racing between COVID and injury last year have been quite odd and went through a lot of, won't dive into this, but last year was a hard year because I wasn't racing and everybody else was. COVID year was one thing when mostly everybody else was sitting on the back burner. But last year, having a fractured foot and sitting on the sidelines, something that I didn't have much say in <laughs> was pretty hard because it was like grieving the loss of my race season, which may sound silly for a lot of people, but that's virtually what it was, was grieving the loss of a race season. So it was yeah. a lot to go through. Yeah, I think that would be tough, especially right at following like that year of COVID where yeah. It's weird because this is all I've known my entire life and I kind of sat back and like it hit me that one day I am going to retire from driving and it was like who am I outside of this that I really had to discover. So coming back this year I'm a much different, I don't want to say I'm a different person, I still am the driver I am and goal orientated but I've had a summer where I wasn't racing and I wasn't Amber LaRue, the truck wagon driver. I was Amber LaRue, the 28 year old at the time, just living life. So I got to dig into some stuff that I needed to and I'm coming back mentally a lot more stronger. So that's pretty neat. So like, I'm just trying to imagine the steps growing up to becoming eventually like a driver. Cause it's a very, there's a lot to know and it's like yeah. high risk, right? So how did your parents teach you? Like, how, how did you learn this? I was in and around it. Um, there's a picture of me where I can't probably be more than like seven, eight years old in the wagon box taping in lines for dad. Um, now it's a little frowned upon to have kids in wagons, but growing up around the ponies, dad would let me drive in the infield after the race because where big wagons, you go right off the track, ponies, we had to go back into the infield most of the time. So I would drive in the infield after the races once the horses were cooling down and as soon as I was big enough, like I moved in with dad when I was 13. So since the spring of being 13, 14, I've been the one doing most of the training for these guys. And as for harnessing and driving, it's just been kind of second nature because you grew up right in it and you learn, you know, I wanted to be hands-on, it's what I wanted to do, so I learned everything I possibly could and drove as many outfits as I could in a day to get where I am. So, like, why do you do this? What, what drives you to do this? This, this part of it. I love the horses and I grew up in wagon racing, so it's what I do, but I love the training of it. I love watching these horses go from day one, being chubby and out of shape, come out of winter, shed out, shine up, leg up, and just seeing the confidence build in them as they get stronger. And not only that, driving wise, you take a horse like Little C, who right now is like scared of his shadow coming out of the barn, and by Lloyd Finals in the fall, in 2019, I really watched him develop as a horse. And it's unfortunate that he's had two years off because now he's kind of back to being a little bit scared of his shadow. But by Lloyd Finals that year, he was so ecstatic about life. He was ready to take anything on after driving and racing in front of that grandstand. And seeing a horse develop in three months like that is pretty unique to just see their personality change as they get more confident and brave, all because of your training and how you handle them and treat them. That part I love. And, and so like, what are your goals this season? I want to be in the top 15 and my biggest goal is to get an invite to the Calgary Stampede. Wagon race in the home stretch drive. Calgary, it's your turn to come alive. 
Logan Gorst on the inside. Vern Nolan Denton's Canada. Court is in session, and here comes the Duke of Dewberry, Kurt Benzman. But that is my goal. I want to drive in front of that grandstand. It's it's really crappy because my dad died March 1st, but in 2001, when Vern and Shane Nolan was their first year, their um, dad really looked up to those boys. We raised ponies together and he saw them grow up. And when they made Calgary, dad made the point that summer to take a weekend off racing. And we drove down to Calgary. And I remember standing on the tarmac with my dad and just taking it all in. And yeah, it's unfortunate that dad's not gonna see me there one day, but that's where I wanna be and that's what I wanna do. Tell me a little bit about your dad. Oh. <laughs> My dad loved animals. Didn't matter whether it was a horse, a cow, a chicken. And he raised me and my siblings with the concept that animals always come first. And he had a passion for wagon racing like no other. And raised me under the belief that you didn't have to buy the best horse. And a horse that you picked up didn't always have to be the prettiest because you could make them into anything you wanted them to be if you put the time and effort in. And a lot of the times racing ponies and the, the outfit that I was most competitive with, the left leader was a runaway for everybody else. The right leader, when we got her, she fit a 24 inch collar and she was a running pony. And by the t like she was borderline foundered when we got her um, and we got her in shape and when she was racing to put things in perspective she wore an 18 inch collar so she was that much overweight she had a hump in her neck so we got her going uh, the right wheeler we had bought for $250 as a baby and took a chance on he had measured out it's racing ponies you have to measure them in and the left wheeler over on the reserve one winter she was starving to death as a four year old and we had picked her up. So my best outfit running ponies was four horses that were everybody else's misfits. And not that every one of the thoroughbreds standing in my barn were somebody else's misfits, but they all got there for a reason. And yeah, I have never been known for buying the most expensive horses on the track, but I have been known for having some of the prettiest and in turn, I pick up a lot of horses that I see something in that a lot of people may not see anything in and take a chance on them. And that's definitely something I got from my dad because when dad brought home that mare that was almost starved to death that winter and you couldn't even brush her, she was so scared of people. I was like, I wasn't very old. I want to say I was 13 or 14 years old. And I was like, dad, I don't even think that mare is going to make the winter. And he's like, yes, she will long as you take care of her and we could barely get a halter on her and I was like what are we doing and he's like if you get that mare to the point where she can race she will give you her heart in return and that she did that mare pulled the wagon every night with everything she had oh. <laughs> <laughs> I told myself I wasn't gonna cry yeah this, I knew it yeah. <laughs> cry. <laughs> it's gonna be a very emotional season I yeah I might as well just embrace it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll be following Amber and her horses, Team Pink, throughout the summer. Team Pink will run their first races at Poundmaker, Saskatchewan on June 15th to 19th. Go, Amber! I'm Lisa Gunther, your host this week and editor of Canadian Cattlemen. Thanks for listening. It's been a blast. No matter how big or small your operation is, every producer could always use a little help. That's why RBC is giving you the chance to win an S540 Bobcat Skid Steer Loader. Make your day just a little more efficient with this versatile piece of equipment. Clear snow, spread manure, or muck out stalls all with the same machine and be able to do more faster. Visit scoraskidsteer.com backslash rules for full contest details. Contest closes June 15, 2022.